The Boston Celtics shoot way too many three-pointers. At this point in the NBA, we are finally starting to see a threshold for three-point shots where if you take it to too far of a degree, you are just at a certain point neglecting otherwise higher quality shots, whether that be around the rim or otherwise. And if there was really anything that concerns me about the Celtics and the potential championship run they could make this year, it would be that they are overly reliant on three-point shooting. Hello everybody, welcome to Oss Rusty Bucket. Subscribe to the channel if you have not already and drop a like on this video. It only takes one second and makes a massive difference in how this video performs in the YouTube algorithm. As you can tell, this is going to be a hot takes video for every single team in the NBA. The first take there about the Celtics, I kind of borrowed from Alex Hoops from a discussion that we had on our podcast. So if you want to see a further explanation of that, the most recent upload on this channel goes over it. And if you want, you can just watch the full podcast as well uh, but with that said we're gonna go team by team here uh, next we got the Philadelphia 76ers and my hot take about them is I don't know this this is just a feeling but I think this is the year that Joel Embiid finally doesn't choke in the playoffs I think that the way that the system for the Sixers has been built around Embiid this year has definitely elevated his game to the best degree it's ever been I like Tyrese Maxey as the second option more more than James Harden, and I like the playmaking role that Embiid has been utilizing, which has definitely opened up his ability as a creator, and likely means that he'll be better at dealing with double teams than he was in the past, which is a huge issue for him in the postseason, typically speaking. For the New York Knicks, after trading for OG and Anobi, I'm going to declare this to be the best playoff team the Knicks have had since the Carmelo Anthony era, so this would be the best Julius Randle era Knicks team. I really like the fit with OG and it kind of makes me able to enjoy the Knicks far more than I've ever been able to before just because their play style always annoyed me. But OG out there just kind of made the whole roster make sense and I'm uh, kind of high on this team where, you know, that's not something I'm typically saying about the Knicks at any point. Unfortunately, these can't all be positive and my hot take for the Brooklyn Nets is I do not think that Cam Thomas is all that good. He's been on a really rough shooting streak lately and as I discussed in my Death of the Power Forwards and Who's Next video, I don't think the archetype of shot creator who can't play make and also really isn't a defender or anything else really I just don't think that type of player is a very good one I understand he's young and I understand that he's exciting so people project a lot of stuff onto him but ultimately I think Cam Thomas is destined to be a sixth man I understand that like at this stage in a player's career it's weird to put such like a limiting perspective on them but I've really seen no improvements to the all-around aspects of Cam's game I have seen minor improvements on defense and that is about it otherwise he's pretty much the same player that he's always been he's just finally been afforded more opportunity uh, for the Nets I think a limited role rather than being a go-to scoring option all the time is probably where Cam will actually find a place in the NBA um, so yeah I'm way lower on Cam Thomas than a lot of people are for the Toronto Raptors this one's kind of out of left field because I definitely wouldn't have said this a while ago but I might not trade Pascal C Siakam. Uh, I've been talking about trading Siakam as well as a plenty of other players on the Raptors for the past couple of years and how they need to do it and they're just wasting everybody's time by not doing it. But after the OG for RJ and quickly deal, I like this Raptors team a lot more. I, I'm really happy that this trade in general went down because I'm managing to enjoy two teams that I otherwise did not beforehand. Um, and Siakam, I, I just think this team can be relatively competitive and the Raptors at this point have done the we're not going to fully blow it up thing. So if you're going to stick to that kind of mentality, I don't necessarily think trading Siakam is necessary, especially given that Siakam has indicated that he doesn't want to leave the Raptors. Uh, I might not trade him, especially because his value isn't particularly high. Uh, I think you could mold the roster as it is now into a playoff team, especially if Emmanuel quickly breaks out as a star player like I think he will and like I think he's showing multiple signs 
signs of doing in Toronto. For the Milwaukee Bucks, I think the concerns about this team are dramatically overblown. They have one of the best records in the NBA, and while yes, their defense is not as good as it has been in the past, they traded that defense for easily the best offense this Bucks team has ever had. Uh, right now, Dame and Giannis have the best points per game average out of the pick and roll of any duo in the entire NBA. Giannis is having one of the best, if not the best season of his career. It seems like they're getting an easy look on every freaking possession. Like, I understand it's an identity shift, so people like freaked out about how different it was, but ultimately they were trading some defense for offense, and the offense has been great. The defense still should be better, and I think will be better in the postseason, uh, but people freaked out about this team early. I thought it was silly then, and I think it's especially silly now to just act like this team is not a real threat. They absolutely are just as legitimate a threat as really anybody else. For the Indiana Pacers, my take about them is that the defense could be a lot better without making a single trade. A lot of the problem with Indiana's defense comes down to the scheme as well as some of the players that are or really are not in their rotation. Um, the main one that stands out is Jarris Walker, who's a really good defensive player as a rookie, but I also feel like Miles Turner has been utilized incorrectly on the defensive end of the floor. And and in general, there's just really no emphasis or effort whatsoever. And effort is like half of the battle on the defensive end of the floor. Uh, I realize there are definitely bad defenders in this group. I'm not going to pretend like there's just a bunch of good defenders choosing not to play defense here, but it could definitely be considerably better. Uh, and it's kind of annoying to me that they're not making a lot of rather simple changes to get into that category. For the Cleveland Cavaliers, they're in kind of a desperate situation because the looming fear of losing Donovan Mitchell is right around the corner. Um, one thing I would do to potentially alleviate that, and this might sound a little radical, but I think I might trade Jarrett Allen. Uh, not anything against Jarrett Allen specifically. It's just, I think if this Cavs team is going to be super good in the future, it's going to be because Evan Mobley has elevated his game to a significant degree. And I think by playing him at the power forward position alongside Mobley, or sorry, alongside Allen, you are kind of putting training wheels on him. I think it'd be better just to throw him to the wolves, make him play the center position, make him figure that out. And if it doesn't work out, then that's rough. But I think you kind of need to figure out if it's going to work out or not. And if you just, you know, keep making him just dip the toe in the pool of being a lead franchise option and not actually put him in that position, then you're just going to keep getting tentative results as we have for his entire career. It would also probably help the spacing. Uh, it would also probably make Mobley's game scoring wise considerably easier, easier just because he doesn't have to worry about having another big in the paint. For the Chicago Bulls, my hot take is that fans need to pump the brakes on Kobe White a little bit. Don't get me wrong. I think you have every right to be excited. I'm excited myself about the fact that he's just a lot better than I thought he was ever going to be. However, I don't think Kobe White is a future all-star, at least not a perennial one, and I would be pissed if the Bulls built around Kobe after building around Zach Levine, because while Kobe does have a much better all-around game than Zach Levine, he's also not as natural of a scorer uh, and not as consistent of a scorer. We're talking about a relatively small sample size for Kobe here, and one way or the other, I really hope that we can aspire to build around players more talented than Kobe White and Zach Levine in the future, and it just pains me to see the franchise make similar mistakes. I don't, it doesn't necessarily mean the franchise is going in this direction, but it seems like the fans want it to go in that direction, and I think that's just wildly stupid and immediately regrettable very soon. So just don't do that. Please don't do that. Kobe White's good. He can be here in the long term, and he can be a great third option, but let's not do the thing where we act like the player is more than it is because I've seen this franchise make that mistake time and time again, and it drives me fucking crazy. The Detroit Pistons can still beat literally any college team. Please stop saying otherwise. It's really, really silly. Uh, don't get me wrong. I think the Pistons have a lot of guys on the roster who will not be in the NBA in the very near future, but almost every college roster has one to four players, maybe five maybe six if you've got some extreme roster where those guys could theoretically make the NBA. Uh, but this is a roster of players who have made the NBA 
And many of them, a couple of them at least, actually belong in the NBA. You know, Marvin Bagley, Jalen Duran, uh, Cade Cunningham. Honestly, sometimes I feel like Kevin Knox does just because he plays pretty good for the Pistons when he plays. Uh, I think Killian Hayes still can have a position in the NBA, even though he's definitely asked to do way too much. What's the name of the guard that uh, Monty Williams seems to hate? I can't remember his name right now. Oh my God. Well, that guy, Jaden Ivey. Yeah, Jaden Ivey is also going to be an NBA player. So just like, stop saying that. That that I understand the Pistons are a historically bad team, but every time a historically bad team happens, this conversation comes up. And every time it comes up, I have to say it's stupid. The Miami Heat are a better team this year than they were last year. And I don't just mean that in terms of uh, being better better in the regular season because they're like obviously better in the regular season than they were last year. I believe they're the four seed right now. Um, however, the depth is better. I like their role players more. I really, really like Jaime Hawkes Jumer. J- Jumer? Really? I've, I'm trying to get his name right and I said Jumer instead of Junior. Uh, Jaime. I think it's Jaime. I've been corrected on it so many times. Jaime. Yes? I don't know. He's really fucking good. He's one of my favorite players in the league, and I can't quite pronounce his name. It pisses me off. But either way, he's really good. Uh, Bam's really good. Kevin Love's weirdly having a really good year. Tyler Hero's having a great year. Jimmy Butler is Jimmy Butler. I just like this roster a lot, and I think they could be better in the postseason than they were last year. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to find as much success and go as far as the NBA Finals like they did, uh, because that's I think that was a pretty extreme thing to happen that time. But in terms of of like giving other teams in the conference a real run for their money that I think ultimately should be better teams. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna say the Heat can't beat the Celtics personally. I'm just not gonna do it. The Orlando Magic are one really good and reliable point guard away from being a really good playoff team. I'm not gonna say contender tier, but in terms of just being a team that can make the second round, I think that you know they've kind of had a weird guard situation. That the past couple of years. Markel Fultz is generally a positive, but he obviously has his limitations. Uh, I think Jalen Suggs has been more of a two this year, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you know, Cole Anthony is a cool scoring option, but I'm just talking like a pure, if not a star level point guard, at least a guy who can be, you know, vaguely alluded towards being in that tier. Um, but yeah, one really good point guard away from like, wow, the magic can fuck you up in a playoff series. The Atlanta Hawks. I I feel like building around Trey Young is a pretty futile effort. This is not a knock on Trey Young. This is just me essentially borrowing the same argument that, you know, Becky Hammond has used, which is correct, which is that historically small guards are just never the best player on a championship team. Steph Curry has done it. Isaiah Thomas has done it, but otherwise doesn't happen. And while Trey Young, I do think is a very good star level talent because of his height limitation i just don't think he's quite a superstar talent and you need a superstar talent to win a championship um and you especially need one to be so adamant about building around them otherwise you build around zach levine for seven years yeah i'm not saying trade trey young but i'm also not saying don't trade trey young and apparently according to Woj, that is something that is potentially on the table because he has said that the hawks are pretty much open to trading anybody if the right package is presented and I just think that Trey is just not the guy if you're building really truly making the effort to build towards a contender now the Atlanta Hawks being the staple franchise of mediocrity throughout history because they like historically have a near 500 record as a franchise um you know if you just want to be a pretty good playoff team for a while and do that off of the back of Trey Young you're definitely more than okay doing that but uh expecting Trey to be a number one expecting to build a contender around him in the long term I'm just really not seeing it unless you just do some crazy good (laughs) GMing uh and thus far the Hawks have not done that. My take about the Charlotte Hornets is they deserve all of their failure for employing Miles Bridges. For the Minnesota Timberwolves, I'm going to go ahead and declare this to be the best Timberwolves team in their franchise's history. There's really only one other team that could compete with it, and that is the 04 
Timberwolves who won uh, 59 games, I believe it was. Uh, and they had MVP Kevin Garnett, who's one of my favorite players of all time. Uh, and they made a conference finals run. They were just unfortunately a little bit too thin other than like Sam Cassell and I think, uh, what's what's his name? The guy who choked his coach, uh, Latrell Sprewell. Uh, there were a couple of other guys, but for the most part, it was just Kevin Garnett's individual dominance. I think from a team perspective, from a roster perspective, this is the deepest Timberwolves team. This is the most well-rounded Timberwolves team, and this is the most talented Timberwolves team. No one on this team individually compares to how good Kevin Garnett was, but the collective of the roster, I think is better. The OKC Thunder, I think need one more truly reliable, like 30 plus minute per game postseason player for me to really confidently call Call them a contender. Uh, it doesn't need to be a star guy. It doesn't have to be like Lowry Markinen specifically as cool as that would be. I just don't think the depth is as good as I'd like it to be. After uh, Chet Holmgren, you also don't really have a lot of size. Josh Giddy is, I don't know how that guy is going to translate to a postseason setting. Um, and I also think like scoring option wise, like you're basically J-Dub and Chet are like your two and three and they kind of alternate between who's getting more shots and all that uh and i think all i think it's all good but it's just also not like the most confident i could possibly be in a postseason team i love this okc roster they're one of my favorite teams in the league this year but i think you can just get one more guy in there doesn't have to be a great player just someone who i know you can rely on and from there i'm like okay i'm solidly locked in to calling this team a contender speaking of larry markinen my take for the utah jazz is that they should not trade him and that the win streak that they they have been on really isn't all that surprising to me. Obviously, this team was quite competitive last year towards the start of the year, and they kind of bottomed out as the season went along. Uh, but they're 12 and four in their last 16, haven't lost consecutive games since their most recent lo losing streak, which was back in early December. Uh, I just think the Jazz are actually pretty good. Like, definitely can compete for a play-in spot. Definitely could uh, be a team that bothers someone in the playoffs. Uh, and I don't think that the Jazz are necessarily in the position where they like have to have a high draft pick. Uh, I think there's already a lot of young players on this team to be excited about and they have a ton of draft capital from trading Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert from other teams. You know, I'm not all that sure that the Timberwolves are going to be bad in the near future, but the Cavs very much have the potential to be. Uh, they're not very good this year. So yeah, I would just write it out and trust in your front office to draft well where you are. I don't think tanking is all that necessary here and I think Larry Markkinen is young enough and good enough to just keep him around for the long haul. For the Denver Nuggets, I think Peyton Watson is going to be their most significant and important bench piece in the postseason. All respect to Reggie Jackson and the frankly pretty ridiculous season he's happening. He's happening. He's having. Peyton Watson, really good defender and he's finally kind of found his three-point shot and he's really good at cutting back door and he's pretty decently even abusing mismatches and uh, creating a shot real fast within the flow of the offense, making quick decisions, all the kind of things you want within Denver's system, all the things you want playing off of Jokic. Uh, and I just think as a big defensive forward, he's just going to ultimately be more valuable than a small scoring guard, especially when you already have Jamal Murray. My hot take for the Portland Trailblazers is that I think Scoot Henderson might be better suited continuing to come off of the bench. This was something that I was initially against, to be clear. Uh, so I'm definitely admitting some incorrectness in this regard. But uh, ever since he has come back from injury and been a starter, his numbers have not been amazing, specifically in terms of impact. I know that the team isn't necessarily trying to win all that much, but, you know, they had an embarrassing, embarrassing loss to OKC, where Scoot, as a starter, had a negative 
negative 57 plus minus, which is the second worst plus minus an individual player has ever posted. So that's not good. Uh, and if you look at the impact on the floor as a starter versus on the bench, in the 15 games he played off of the bench, he was a plus point zero point nine, which for a bad team with a losing record ain't too shabby, versus now as a starter, he is a negative 22 in the eight games that he has played. His efficiency outside of his three-point shooting, which has been nice to see be better, uh, it's pretty rough. Uh, it's just, yeah, I, I would just rather see him in a slightly more reduced role, just getting better rest and I think it'd be better for the development of the other players on this team, specifically uh, Shade and Sharp. Um, I'm not like super committed to this because I also feel like it is beneficial just to throw him to the wolves and make him make his mistakes now, but uh, it might be worth uh, seeing about bringing him back to the bench. For the Sacramento Kings, I think De'Aaron Fox's ascension as a three-point shooter is both really pivotal towards the potential success of him as a future player and scaling him to be even better than I I thought he could be but also it's just something that's gone fairly under mentioned uh this year he is shooting 39 percent from three on eight attempts per game the best he's done percentage wise before that was 37 when he was taking three a game and like volume to percentage wise i guess the season before at five on 32.4 percent is the best he's done before that never been high volume to this degree and never been high efficiency to this degree uh and being that good is really going to make a world of difference for his game for the Sacramento Kings uh, and it's just something that deserves more credit because this kind of shooting leap is not that common. It's a pretty extreme circumstance. For the Phoenix Suns, this team is firmly not a contender in my eyes. I think they'd have to get so many lucky things to happen for them to make a conference finals run. So I'm just gonna say, yeah, not contenders, not to me. Just not seeing it. For the Lakers, firing Darvin Ham is not enough. This team needs a lot of changes, and that is just the beginning. Don't get me wrong. Fire Darvin Ham. They need to do that. They needed to do it a while ago. Frankly, they needed to never fire Frank Vogel in the first place. But since they have done it, they need to undo it. And then there's probably a couple of trades that need to happen. Because while this team definitely has a lot of depth and a lot of versatility, I have felt for a while now that depth and versatility to a degree is a little bit overrated and you're just you know i'd rather have five really good players rather than like two really good players and eight solid players you know what i mean maybe not quite to that degree but uh you get what i'm saying there's there's definitely some retooling to the roster that is necessary um and firing darvin ham isn't going to solve all your problems for the golden state warriors this one i'm is another take i'm kind of tentative on i'll say it as in like a couple of years from now like maybe two maybe three seasons but if they keep running this back not really making major and i mean major adjustments to this roster i think there's definitely a chance that uh steph curry would maybe not want to be a golden state warrior anymore as crazy as that sounds he is also good enough and can be good enough for the next couple of years to not want to waste the last couple of seasons of his career putting up great individual numbers Numbers, but not really competing for shit. Uh, and he was recently quoted as saying, if things stay the same, that's the definition of insanity, right? Keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result. That's what he was asked about the trade deadline and whether this group of players would really be good enough. So sounds to me like he wants change and you know, if they just go a couple more years of like still trying to make the big three happen, it might be enough to actually push him out. I know he's super loyal to Golden State, so that's why I feel weird saying this, but I wouldn't blame him. Uh, I would hate for it to happen because I think it's really cool when a player plays their entire career on one team, but Stephen Curry is also too good to just waste away the last couple of years of his career. I think that would be also sad, more sad than him leaving. For the New Orleans Pelicans, I think if Zion Williamson returned to form like truly was as good as he was his second season, then they're contenders. 
Definitely not higher tier contenders, definitely in the B tier contender category. However, if the Pelicans with Zion being dominant made a conference finals run, I wouldn't be surprised at all. But you know, 22 points per game Zion, I don't think that's gonna cut it. I need to see 26, 27 points per game Zion before I'm really believing in the Pelicans. For the Houston Rockets, I think Jabari Smith Jr. is one of the most underrated young players in the entire NBA. He's already one of the better defensive young players in the entire league is a really long and versatile forward and offensively speaking he really fills his role well he rebounds well and he is a 39% three-point shooter on decent volume I, I just really like Jabari Smith and he's probably my favorite player on the entire Rockets team weirdly enough uh, and I think he deserves a little bit more credit for the Memphis Grizzlies I think Ja Morant's injury is going to be a blessing in disguise I understand why you would want to just make the most winning move possible and pursue a deep playoff run this year but i also feel like if you just suck this year get a good draft pick use that to retool the roster a little bit and then come into next year with what that roster looks like fully healthy no suspension to deal with at the start of the year i think that team comes in and kicks absolute ass uh more so than they would have if they just played out this entire year and then came back the next year within that context so i I do think that this is going to be overall a positive for the Grizzlies, as painful as it may be right now. And last, but well, I guess they are the least, uh, the San Antonio Spurs. My hot take is that Jeremy Sohan is bad and not just as a point guard. Uh, I've you know, clarified this a few times, but not to the degree that I am right now. It's not just that I think he can't play point guard. I don't know that he's gonna be much of an NBA player, period, at, very, at the very least, He's not going to be much of an NBA player to the degree in which the Spurs franchise seems to treat him like it. Uh, you know, like even the decision to play him at point guard is for Jeremy Sohan's development as if Jeremy Sohan's development is some super important thing to the future of this franchise. I don't think it is. He's pretty bad on offense. He's fine enough finishing, I guess, but he can't shoot worth a lick. And his defense is cool, but it's not good enough to justify being a bad offensive player his playmaking chops are positive for a forward but his scoring ability isn't enough to really utilize it all that effectively I just don't think Jeremy Sohan's very good and I don't think he's going to be very good I hate that I had to end on such a negative hot take but I guess it is what it is oh wait I think I skipped I skipped the Mavericks Rudy just yelled at me from the other room that I always skipped the Mavericks well unfortunately I'm going to end on a negative take again because the Mavericks take is negative uh I think the Mavericks are the epitome of of pretenders they are the direct example of a team i would say that like looks like they could compete for a championship but like let's be real the only way that doesn't happen is if luca just does absurd luca shit and they are able to maintain and ride that wave throughout a postseason run however generally speaking it seems like luca does luca shit for a good amount of time then runs out of energy and then no one's really there to pick up the slack Kyrie irving is a better option option to pick up the slack than anything that they have had before but I also think the defense just ain't good enough which isn't necessarily a new perspective uh I like them a lot and I like Luca a lot and I think they've got plenty of potential after a retool in the offseason but I just don't think it's happening this year anyways those are my hot takes let me know what you think of them let me know your hot takes in the description below and thank you to Nick for editing this video the link to his channel and his podcast the coping hour is going to be in the description but that is it goodbye <laughs>